Welcome and thank you for joining us for this webinar presentation. We are the Cybersecurity and Information Systems Information Analysis Center, or CSIAC, one of three IAC domains in the DoD Information Analysis Centers operating under the Defense Technical Information Center, DTIC, within the Office of the Undersecretary of Defense for Research and Engineering. Our informative webinar series highlights current and emerging research and technology developments. It presents an opportunity for accelerating the DOD's leverage of these advancements by increasing awareness and fostering technical collaboration. CSIAC serves as one of the premier information research partners and curators of technology advancements and trends for the cybersecurity and information systems community. As such, our organization supports those working in the cybersecurity and information systems domain of DOD research and engineering. We do so by helping navigate the vast landscape of scientific and technical information, allowing our customers to get a head start on their technical projects. With an understanding of the cybersecurity and information systems DOD research and engineering landscape, we provide research and analysis services. We help unlock access to information, knowledge, and best practices from government, industry, and academia to stimulate innovation, foster collaboration, and eliminate redundancy. We hope you enjoy this webinar presentation and that it serves as a catalyst for community collaboration and improved DoD cybersecurity and information systems research. Good day, everyone. My name is Philip Payne. I am the technical lead for the Cybersecurity and Information Systems Information Analysis Center. Uh, before we get started today, I would like to note a couple of administrative items. First, if you would dial in by phone and would like a copy of the slides, they were posted to the CSIAC webinar announcement. You can go to csiac.org forward slash webinars and find today's webinar. When you click on it at the bottom of the announcement, it will say to view the webinar. Please click here. Second, all participants are muted, but feel free to chat using the attendee chat on the lower, lower right-hand side of the webinar screen. You can use that to chat with each other, and I will be monitoring that chat as well. However, if you'd like to pose a question for the Q&A session at the end, please click the icon on the bottom right, uh, labeled more or paneled options. That's on the bottom right to bring up the Q&A window as part of your layout. At the end of the presentation, I'll go over the Q&A for the benefit of those on the phone. I will read out the I will read the question out loud to the presenter. Um, if you have any technical issues during the presentation, have no fear. The full presentation will be available online. Uh, please check back to the CSI website. Uh, once the webinar is posted, the go to webinar button will take you to the YouTube link. Um, with that said, I will pass it off now to today's webinar presenter. Thank you. Good afternoon. This is uh, Steve Pitcher. I'm the uh, Senior Cyber Survivability Analyst for the Joint Staff. Uh, many of you may have listened in on last week's DAU presentation uh, for Zero Trust, the summit that they had. And it's a very similar briefing. However, this time I'll be able to spend uh, more time on the uh, on the briefing itself and allow questions uh, as we go. Uh, the focus of this uh, of this briefing and for cyber survivability endorsement is uh, even though standards and capability require uh, capability statements are critical to being able to develop anything. Uh, what CSE helps to do is provide the operator, the the resource sponsor, the requirement sponsor, the ability to uh, state the mission focused, threat informed, and system specific threshold performance requirements for cyber survivability, which includes both cybersecurity and cyber resilience. The, uh, the implementation guide, the CSC implementation guide was updated last July uh, and it is publicly releasable. Uh, if to, all of the information in there, you know, some of it was classified just uh, three years ago and I'll show you what that is as we go through. But uh, today, this is all publicly releasable information you're getting. <clears throat> what I'm going to cover today is why, you know, why are we doing cyber survivability? What are the hidden costs and risks of not specifying uh, specific cyber threshold performance requirements? You know, what are the challenges that we have in integrating and uh, uh, integrating capabilities and the long life cycle risks of, of the 
acquisition cycle. You know, and then how can CSE help to reduce the resource and mission risks throughout a life cycle if things are considered early? And a little emphasis on why cybersecurity compliance is necessary but not sufficient, but why uh, CSE is actually complementary to the uh, cybersecurity guidance that's out there. And then I'm going to show you how uh, how you could apply CSE for uh, for de determining the zero trust threshold performance requirements and also show you the status of voluntary cyber endorsement adoption across the department. Uh, but there again, these are system specific threat informed and uh, mission focused cyber survivability threshold performance requirements. Uh, this all started in 2015, actually, when the DepSecDef got a one, one too many operational test briefings uh, highlighting that the same dirty dozen vulnerabilities were found every year in too many weapon systems. And that these high risk vulnerabilities were at that time very well known and should have been fixed prior to operational test. However, now that they were, you know, they were found at this, at, as it's being implemented, the fixes would now be caught, you know, more costly and harder to perform, and in many cases had to just be accepted because they were so foundational in their nature. Uh, what we found though, that the probable root cause for all of that was that legacy systems only contractually binding cyber threshold performance requirement was to get enough cybersecurity compliance to obtain an ATO. In fact, some of if you look at some of the old ICDs and CDDs, it says we're going to have the best darn cybersecurity program known to man, and we are going to get an ATO. Uh, but despite those signed ATOs and 40 plus DODIs with cyber equities, uh, those very same systems that uh, were, were found in operational tests to have those uh, risky vulnerabilities. Uh, there were no cyber resilience requirements included in there, in addition to the lack of specific system specific cybersecurity ones. There was no adapt resourcing to achieve and sustain a meaningful cyber risk posture over time. And there was no actionable cyber threat to justify the cyber protections for the resource sponsor to be able to take action. And the, the question for you know that I normally have for the audience is. You know, is a 90% RMF cybersecurity compliant capability more survivable than one that's 70%? And the answer is really, it, it depends. Uh, you know, what is the 30% that's missing in the one system versus what's the 10% missing in the other? And if the 10% that's missing in the uh, more compliant system, uh, if those place the move, shoot, and communicate functions of the weapon system at risk, then it's quite possible that the 70% compliance system would be more so. But cyber server endorsement addresses those three rate root causes and places cyber in the same operational risk trade space with a program manager's other system functional requirements for cost, schedule, and performance. In other words, we don't need to even have a separate dev sec ops uh, function because it is now part of DevOps. Cyber is now part of the same functionality considerations at same operational risk trade space. Uh, the GAO report from, 2019, uh, from 2021 found that uh, the DOD is doing a better job with more cyber assessments. However, they were still not, even though they were finding more vulnerabilities earlier, those vulnerabilities uh, were con continued to be found, were not mitigated, were not addressed as they went through the uh, the life cycle, and so they were still a problem. But the you know the premise of this, and you can see it in the title of the document, is that guidance would help DoD programs better communicate requirements to contractors, and that's the intent of CSE. It is not to say what the standards are that people need to be trained to to be able to develop capability, although those are important it actually defines those contractually binding cybersecurity and cyber resilience threshold performance requirements. The problem is, and the GAO report will probably find it on the next one, is that even though it's mandatory for joint systems, it is not mandatory for all service developments, uh, MTAs, GUONs, and so on. Uh, even though the Army has now put out their, their acquisition policy documents that actually say that uh, 
determining your cyber star risk category and also considering the cyber star attributes is mandatory for all IT acquisitions. I put this slide up there so that you see that reason, you know, CDC is focused on acquisition performance requirements because standards by themselves have not done what we need. Uh, and we have to be able to define success for these capabilities, these weapon systems and so on. Uh, so you see, I did, I'm, am I seeing questions? If are people not hearing me, it sounds like there's a speaker problem. Can everybody hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Steve. Um, we did just get one question in the Q&A. Feel free to address it now, or we can save it for the end. Um, that's totally up to you. No, I can take them as we go. Um, I kind of prefer it because that way it's still in the in the area that's there. Uh, it may okay. have popped no off problem. the screen. What's the What's the question there? Okay, I'll, I'll read them aloud as they come in. Then. That's that's no problem. Uh, so the first question we have today is from George. He said, "Why is there no cyber resilience overlay for RMF?" No cyber resilience overlay for oh, <laughs> um, that's one of the things that we're actually working on. Uh, the DoD eighty five hundred and DoDi eighty five hundred that are going through review. Um, we believe that uh, that they should be considering more than just cybersecurity. That uh, that cyber resilience should be part of the uh, considerations because if actually if you can you know there's a need for a balance of cybersecurity and cyber resilience along with a balancing of the of the other functional requirements for a weapon system but you know if you if you can only secure a system to a certain level um, if you can add some resilience to it, you can reduce the mission risk. So there needs to be that balance. And uh, uh, I'm looking for help anywhere we can to to help in, to integrate that into the RMF and show the folks that do RMF that this is actually a win-win for everyone. Uh, because if we define our threshold performance requirements for cybersecurity and cyber resilience, now, when when they're doing the RMF uh, process, they can ensure that that we take less risks in those areas that uh, uh, those areas where there is functional implications to the move, shoot, and communications uh, move, move, shoot, and communicate aspects of a weapon system. Uh, I hope that answered the question. If it didn't, I'll I'll address it again later. How's that? Okay, well, cyber survivability endorsement, it does, it, it pre, it's, its pillars are prevent, mitigate, recover from, and adapt to. And the cybersecurity framework primarily focuses on the prevent, mitigate, and recover. And if you do it properly, there is an adapt component, but it is not a direct component. Uh, so you've got this, but cybersecurity standards and cyber resilience engineering fit within that. And just because you've done, you know, you've, you've, you've implemented cybersecurity standards doesn't mean that the system is survivable. And that's why we need to go to, uh, to add into that, the cyber resilience engineering piece. <clears throat> now, during development, I've, I've stolen this slide from a doctor. I mean, uh, yeah, he's actually a doctor as well, but uh, Dollar Young, Colonel Dollar Young. Uh, before he retired and the defense systems management college came up with the the line at the top there that 70 percent of the funds uh, are committed prior to design uh, 85 percent at coding and 95 percent of the funds are, are committed prior to most defects being found and 90 percent of uh, of defects are actually introduced uh, early on, you know, before, te before testing ever begins, and that those 80% of defects that are found late um, cause 97% of the rework costs. So you can see that if we don't define the threshold performance requirements for cybersecurity and cyber resilience before, you know, during the concept and requirement stage, before design and coding, we're gonna continue to be, you know, behind and accepting risks that we probably shouldn't have to. And the uh, cyber risk uh, sufficiency or the cyber, you know, cybersecurity and cyber resilience sufficiency should be considered at each acquisition milestone. Uh, it's gonna be a little bit different, you know, at the, before the AOA, it's gonna be, did they 
did they define the uh, the considerations for cyber threat? Did they can define the mission uh, mission type and the uh, expected adversary threat tier level, so that you can look you can determine how much cybersecurity and cyber resilience would need to be built in, and so on down the path. But I'm going to have to move along a little bit. So. Uh, some other hidden costs is the loss of trust and, and intellectual property, and this is just an example of some of the uh, uh, some of the events that have occurred, cyber events that have occurred that have impacted on the, lo the loss of trust and intellectual property across the department. Here again, same sort of a thing, but this is also the loss of war fighting advantage. Uh, those technologies that were exfiltrated are being, re, you know, being used to develop new capabilities to threaten us. Uh, there's, you know, the issues of external integration and connectivity risks. Uh, today, you know, this slide could have been drawn up years ago without all of the interconnections, and so there was not the same risk uh, to to uh, to systems and mission. Uh, but now. Uh, the cyber threat is much more time sensitive uh, with serious operational risk implications, because even though before you could use, you know, to take out a kinetic capability, you had to use a lot of, of kinetic bullets to achieve that one kinetic kill. Uh, but today, one cyber bullet can achieve multiple mission kills if those systems are similarly connected and similarly configured. So buying more of any type of system no longer guarantees that resiliency or mission assurance that we used to have before we were so interconnected. Uh, the other challenges are internal and integration and, con and the connectivity risks there. And, you know, we have been uh, pursuing critical intelligence parameters, a, a handful, trying to get a handful. And there really have not been many good ones, but uh, in the last few months, we've actually identified a couple of uh, fairly good generic uh, cyber critical intelligence parameters that can be applied to just about any system. Uh, but even so, the, the attack surface is just so great on weapon systems today that it's very difficult to have just a handful that would be meaningful uh, because the functionality that we've designed into these systems for good to save money, to, to be more efficient, to be more effective um, can also be used for evil. So we have to protect those critical functions that support the move, shoot and communicate aspects. And we have to ensure that those that are most critical are segregated from the other less critical uh, to complete the mission. Uh, go ahead and, and Phil, if there's any questions that come up, just uh, just you know, let me know. I'm I'm not able to really watch that screen so much. Uh, the other one of the other challenges is, of course, long life cycle risks. Our our our, our capabilities are out there for 30 plus years. So how do we define you know the cyber threshold performance requirements with an adapt component? that would allow us to be able to sustain a cyber threshold performance requirement to achieve and sustain a meaningful uh, a risk posture throughout the system's capabilities. Uh, we did publish an article in the Aircraft Survivability Journal in the fall of uh, 22. Uh, that link at the bottom there will, will get you to that uh, story. It's a few pages. It's a very good overview for seniors. If uh, if, if you would like to share this with them, and if you would like more information, uh, we can provide you with a briefing. You know, after you get a chance to review these slides and have more questions, uh, we can come to you or you can come to us or we can try and do something online. Uh, but uh, the big thing for most people is, you know, you know, is there an operational requirement that's more crucial than surviving long enough to accomplish the mission or safely return to base for restoral? And uh, if you, you know, <laughs> the answer is fairly obvious, uh, but that means that we need to go beyond cybersecurity compliance. Uh, this, uh, uh, yes, okay, so go ahead. Our next question is from Merrick. He says, apart from comms, are on the air isolation layers defined for microcontrollers and system internals? Okay. Now that's an that's a question for the like the Air Force um, system security engineering uh, uh, cyber guide. 
uh, what the cyber survivability endorsement is intended to be, it is written. And if you take a look at the implementation guide, it is written for a non cyber security professional to be able to articulate the level of protection and resilience needed. So you, this is your, this is your opportunity for operator input on what the requirement is. However, it also has to be written well enough, those cyber survivability attribute exemplar statements that we have <clears throat> have to be written well enough so that the system security engineer that sees that plain language requirement can consistently and, ef and effectively decompose that high level requirement into the uh, system specifications that can be implemented. So the cyber survival endorsement would not provide that level. Uh, I will show you in a few slides, uh, the level that it goes to. And uh, we, 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 well, we ask for anybody that, that we brief to, we ask for them to take a look at those cyber survivability attributes, ensure that they are holistic, that there aren't cybersecurity requirements or cyber resilience requirements that don't fit within those 10 cyber survivability attributes. And so far, we've only had a couple and we've edited those to, to make that available. Uh, is there another question there? Yes, we got one more in the chat uh, from Travaris. He says, you spoke on how component redundancy doesn't always reduce cyber vulnerabilities. Is the recommendation to also make OSs and software redundant? Yes, and you'll see some of that in a little bit. So, okay, so this acquisition, you know, everybody has seen this acquisition timeline. Uh, and these are some of those questions that uh, people should, you know, people should be looking at to determine, are we addressing at the right time, the, the cyber survivability, cybersecurity, cyber resilience risks at each level. So at, for a resource sponsor, you know, have they done their, have they identified their risk category? Uh, have they identified, uh, you know, come up with a cyber service risk category summary statement, which provides AOA guidance and then so on down the line. So uh, I, I don't really have time to go into a lot of detail, but these are just some of the considerations that you would have at each one of those uh, knowledge points or milestones. Uh, but the big thing is if, if you can identify early on capabilities that really um, don't have the uh, the level of rigor in them to begin with, uh, and it was and it's obvious that it would not be cost effective to attempt to mitigate those to an operationally acceptable level. You can make that kind of rough order of magnitude determination. Uh, this slide really just shows that even though the cyberstar endorsement is only mandatory for systems going through. <clears throat> through the JSIDS process, it really is applicable to any, it could be applicable, it's not, it's not mandated for all, but it could be used for any and all because there is a defining of requirements process. You need to define the cyber as well as the other functional requirements. There's a, an assessing of alternatives, whether it's called an, uh, an assessment of alternatives or, or a uh, capability-based assessment, there's still some uh, assessment of the, the variations or, or options to support it. And we really do need to make sure that it is cyber survival, because if it isn't cyber survival, it's not, it's, it, it has very little operational utility. And those cyber, those 10 cyber survivability attributes can actually be reused as requests for information uh, during an AOA or, you know, during an acquisition uh, itself. So. Here is how we determine the cyber service category. For an ICD, you absolutely have to know your mission type and adversary threat tier. If you don't, you probably shouldn't even be there. Uh, so for determining your risk category early on, those are the two elements that are, that are mandatory. Uh, you, because until you actually do an analysis of alternatives, you don't know what your cyber dependency level the technical cyber dependencies or risks will be unless you are doing you know artificial intelligence machine machine learning uh, or you have an unmanned capability then you know that your cyber dependence level is going to be high so you could use it to help uh, reinforce the level of, uh, of risk category 
uh, and then the impact level until you know how it fits in with everything else you're not going to know but uh, that's how we come up with the uh, cyber cyber story risk category sorry my i have to use my thumb on this thing and it gets tired after a while uh, <clears throat> This is what we've done for the, to determine the mission type. It has survived five years of, uh, of scrutiny, uh, but if you uh, can see where we can improve it, we are open to it. Uh, the, the three top ones are the, most, are the ones that you will mostly see for any weapon system development, uh, and definitely for anything going through JSIVs, they would, they would pretty much have to be in the top three. NSA, well, NSA, CISA, and DOJ got together two years ago and declassified a lot of information on a couple of adversary threats. And that enabled us to come up with the following five adversary threat tiers. We had four, but there was a significant difference between ATT4 and ATT5, and we were able to capture that difference now with the release of, uh, of the version three of the implementation guide last year. So this information would have been secret uh, two years ago, but those three nation capabilities were de, um, you know, were, were declassified two years ago, and we are working with NSA to update this because much of that information has moved down. Now, could we provide more more specific, more technical information and fill up pages of what an extreme or advanced or moderate could be? Yes. But remember, the intent of this CSE guidance is to assist, help those non cybersecurity professionals with an understanding of the risk and the, uh, and the requirements to support that capability. And so it is, it is short. It is not intended to over-engineer it or to provide too much information that would be lost on the seniors. But this is, the, you know, this has probably been the uh, the most appreciated update that we've had uh, because for the first time now, all of the programs that only have unclassified access have something to go on to justify the level of protections and resilience. Cyber dependency level, that criticality analysis is done on what are the functions of, you know, that are most Im impacted in the move, shoot, and communicate uh, uh, areas, and how can we, you know, look, looking at the technical exposure, what's the origin export uh, capabilities of it, and the system architecture combined with that degree of connectivity, internal, external operational crimes, how often does it need to be able to communicate with uh, with others, you know, is it, it's something that's uh, that's 24 by 7. You know, it, it cannot lose uh, the, the connection. Uh, but all of that just helps us to understand the intrinsic cyber risk defined by that. And then the impact level, we, we are still focused on that move, shoot, and communicate capability. And we have five levels that were actually aligned with NIST 8, uh, 830. I modified them just a little bit so that they are more operationally uh, stated. And you can find those in the implementation guide. Um, this is just a, a rough example. You know, that if you've got a mission type of three, an ATT of three, adversary threat tier of three, a cyber dependency level of four, and uh, an impact level of three, that a if you're using high watermark and we don't care what you use, uh, it would be a CSRC four level. Uh, and if you're using subject matter experts, they might pick CSR three or CSA four. But the, the the important thing here is not the exactness of the process, uh, but it's understanding that risk level and potential and the and the resource risk implications, so that you can actually define cyber threshold performance requirements for that operational risk, risk trade space decisions. And if you use, if you take more than a couple hours to determine your risk posture, or your risk category, you've probably overthunk it. And Steve, we have a new question that just popped into the chat uh, from Andres. He said, is the CSC relevant to systems already in production environment or COT software application? Yes, uh, and it, it actually is. And uh, but uh, I'll show you when we get to the uh, the ten cyber survivability attributes. The first six are very difficult to um, 
to modify after you know after the design is done, uh, because that's that's the prevent aspects that are that are engineered in. However, the resilience pieces are applicable to any uh, any system, and, and and the adapt component is part of that. So so these are just the you know if you have that risk category, these are the types of requirements we'd recommend you consider. And here's an actually an example for an ICD. Uh, you saw the threat statement for the eight, for the adversary threat tiers, the one through five. This would be a this would be a five adversary. The countermeasures are those for a CSRC five category that are there in the black. And then for an ICD, we make the the, the statement that that they have that all ten of the cybersecurity attributes must be assessed for for an you know, assessment of alternatives. Uh, so that they can understand kind of a rough order of magnitude the, the resource and mission risk implications if the capability itself if the hosting system or enterprise services are unable to provide that csa's intent so you know it is important that that those requests for information help those um, acquisition professionals identify where it's obvious and uh, so for a CDD, both CDD and ICD, there's not a, you, you don't have a lot of room. You know, there's a page limitation, but the difference here is now that you've gone out for an analysis of alternatives, you you now uh, understand the technologies that are going to be implemented. You can now define a subset of the ten cyber survivability attributes, and that's what's what they you would list down below there because then now they are tailored. And even if you use them as is right out of the implementation guide and many many do use them directly out of there <clears throat> at even though they're unclassified publicly releasable when they're not applied to a system they would at least be uh, cui at this point but now they are contractually binding threshold performance requirements that can be tested to and the testing too is really to the how it's decomposed <clears throat> Cyber, like I've said before, cybersecurity compliance is necessary, but it's not sufficient. Uh, the RMF focuses on providing that cybersecurity controls and standards for a generic system, but it's not threat informed, it's not mission focused, and uh, it's not specific to you know a, a the development that's going on. Uh, but then they also document the compliance of that system with those standards and controls uh, for something that's already been built because they are separate. Uh, Cybersecurity endorsement, on the other hand, it is complementary, uh, but it focuses on providing those contractually binding cybersecurity and cyber resilience threshold performance for a specific system in the expected operating environment. So it helps to justify those resource and design requirements uh, for, pri and for, you know, for, for prioritizing those cyber controls and standards. So the CSE is, you know, some people have said it's very simplistic. For a very technical minded person, yes, it is very simplistic. It does not go to the detail that a system security engineer wants. And that's what the services have been doing with their system security engineering cyber guides and the protection plan updates that have been um, mapped to the cyber survival endorsement uh, very well. So, so this is uh, it. It goes, it, this is what starts the process, gets the operator involved, and helps ensure a consistent understanding of the cybersecurity and cyber resilience required throughout the acquisition process, acquisition life of the system. When we started with CSE, uh, we looked at the NIST 853 uh, REV4 initially controls and identified 239 of the 800 that were, uh, were potentially applicable to weapon systems. Not all of those are applicable and, 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 and weren't back then, uh, but 98 were very highly applicable as written. 86%, 86 required some modification to make it applicable and 55 required a lot of interpretation to meet the intent of that. And we, we see that a, a similar approach is going to be needed to meet the intent of zero trust requirements for weapon systems. All zero trust requirements are not going to be applicable to weapon systems, and most will likely need interpretation to meet the intent. But the cyber survivability attribute tool that the Air Force developed uh, actually incorporates the requirements for you know, NIST 853 Rev 5 and the CNSS 1253 controls uh, along with it. 
Uh, it's also very much aligned with NIST 800-160 Volume 2, and they have been in the process of mapping the MITRE ATT&CK TTPs and National Vulnerability Database. It is a uh, relational database. It's very useful. If you haven't, um, uh, if you haven't seen it, we can provide you with, uh, in, you know, who you can contact to get access to it. But it supports both your efforts to uh, do your RMF compliance as well as ensure that that the technical controls that you are taking uh, will actually help to. Uh, meet the intent of the cyber survivability attributes. Here's an overview of the. Okay. So Which, the when's that? latest question comes from George. He says, since sophisticated software weapons are available at low cost on the internet, is the concept of adversarial capability slash threat meaningful? For example, Black Lotus, possibly one of the most powerful firmware and malware ever created, is available to anybody for just five thousand dollars. This is a very low barrier of entry for an attacker. Over. Yes, I mean, it, 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 of course it is. It has to be. Uh, not you know, it makes things uh, more difficult. But that's part of what we're asking the the um, Intel community to provide us with is a more current adversary threat capability against the hardware, software, firmware by version number that's out there. And a capability like this would, uh, you know, updating the adversary's capabilities down to the lower levels, that uh, that barrier is, you know, that entry, uh, barrier to entry is much lower, that would change those adversary threat tier uh, capabilities. So, in the prevent area, that's you know what do you, what design requirements would you have uh, to identify and protect you know the, the most likely and greatest risk cap you know and address the most the greatest risk, mitigate you know what do you how do you detect and respond you know so that you can enable cyber safety and operational resilience to complete that mission, and then recovery uh, is of course to ensure that after a cyber event. Uh, you know, how can you, you know, the mitigate is to fight through, of course, uh, recover is after the cyber event, how do you fight another day? How can you get to a known good condition? And that doesn't mean the, the capability, the way it was, to, you know, designed to be fielded the day before, but now that you, now that it is not done well in the uh, adversary threat environment, what can you do to uh, bring it to a known good condition so that it can fight another day without being uh, susceptible to the same risks the day before? And then, of course, adapting over time so that you can win not just this war, but the next war. And so for prevent, the first six cyber attributes mitigate the second two, uh, the uh, CSA 9 for recover and CSA 10 for adapt. And I'm going to go into more detail on each and every one of those. Uh, we're going to use the zero trust pillars as an example, um, but you know most of you have seen these capabilities within the zero trust environment for those seven pillars. <clears throat> and what we've done is we've gone and taken and mapped those zero trust capabilities uh, in the in the columns that you see there. It's the same columns that you saw here for user device application workload one through seven. And then we've got the, the cyber cyber attributes on the left hand side and then the same color coding that was used on the previous slide, this one, uh, we've implemented here as well. Uh, so you can see where those, uh, you know, the, the multi-factor authentication and identi identity, uh, uh, identity federation and user credentials uh, would fit within CSA 1 and so on down the line. But uh, that is a... <clears throat> An initial mapping, uh, and we are we're we are wanting to work with well, anybody on this call, but also with the CIO and others on the joint staff to to actually map these things uh, better and uh, go into specifics on it. And that's what really comes into the next slide. Now, for those first six attributes, you'll if you look at the the first one, system shall only allow identified, authenticated, and authorized persons and non-person entities. <clears throat> including uh, all assigned cyber defenders and their tools, access or interconnection. Those are words that are very close to what uh, uh, Zero Trust requires in its 
you know, requirements. But these are exemplars. They're intended to be tailored. So as the cybersecurity professionals get involved with this and the people that are defining the zero trust requirements for a particular system, they would go through here and modify those. And and I think it, one of the earlier questions was, you know, what about the subcomponents and such and the operating systems? If you look at CSA 6, minimize and harden the attack surface, one of the things we identified recently by talking with the Army uh, was that they were having, even though they were defining their cybersecurity attributes very well, they were still having troubles with getting uh, capabilities developed that had subcomponents uh, that did not have you had operating systems that were no longer uh, no longer supported or or using languages that were no longer supported. And so we came up with this language that will probably it, it's drafted for the next iteration implementation guide. But because these are exemplars, it can be used. You don't have to wait to use something like this to to spur your discussion of what are the levels of protection. So, you know, component operating systems must be currently supported, have a reasonable expe expectation of future supportability and have an appropriate trust level. New development must include programming language that reduce su cyber survivability risks, can integrate with other language and has sufficiently low memory process requirements to run on embedded devices. Uh, Rust language being that one. So, so those are the things that, all of these things here are hard to, uh, to, to apply to legacy weapon systems, except for except for the uh, CSA three uh, secure transmissions. Well, you, there are some things. You, you, there are some other things, but uh, the type of crypto you use can clearly be updated on a on a uh, on an older system and and improve and, and secu help to secure your transmission and communication. These. Uh, CSA 7 through 10 are, def are, are directly applicable to uh, legacy systems as well um, because you, the big thing here is the resilience aspects and you need to be baselining your system. You really need to have a configuration management process to be able to, and you have to baseline your system to know what your hardware, software, firmware by version number are uh, <clears throat> for each release that's supported. So that if you have monitoring, you'll know when that baseline has been modified. And then you have to be able to detect those anomalies and report them within a reasoned amount of time. And the red there is really uh, the operator determining what is that, that timeline requirement to provide that, uh, that, 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 uh, you know, that anomaly detection and reporting. And then you have to be resourcing. So these are all resourcing types of things that are after the fact. But if you don't identify them as requirements, it's hard to, you know, it's hard to actually get them uh, fielded. So, you know, who do you have that can manage that system performance once a, an anomaly has been detected and ensure that the system can perform as advertised, at least to complete the mission? And then recovering of capabilities. If you can, if if you can recover a capability before it has a mission impact, the vulnerability risk is low. Even if it's a critical vulnerability, if you can restore that, if you have three hours to restore a system before it has to be up, up and operational again, and you can get it back up in an hour and a half, there's very little mission risk associated with that. And then CSA 10 is probably the most important uh, attribute, probably the, and it has been the most difficult to resource uh, because you have to be able to actively manage that system configuration to achieve and sustain an operational risk posture over time. And with the systems that we have being in inventory for, for up to 30 some years, uh, having that way to under, you know, to get meaningful, intelligence updates on the changes in adversary threat, uh, updates on an understanding of the vulnerabilities in, you know, the vulnerability risks associated with the, syst the system and also the implications from the connected and supporting systems so that a program manager can implement a plan of action milestones to mitigate the risk to the greatest extent. Um, any questions on this so far? Yes, we did get a question in the chat from Marette. 
He said, on the note of weapon systems, our deployment and maintenance stage is covered or just mission level? No, all levels. Uh, throughout the life cycle is being, being considered. Now, I see Tom's answering some questions very well. So, um, but, uh, okay, I, I see the one that Tom's answered there that COTS is you know, a tough one only if the developers are willing to entertain cyber server functionality. Well, if you're looking at uh, at commercial capabilities, COTS capabilities, and you're doing your analysis of alternatives, and if you do have those RFIs for what capabilities are integrated within it, you can make that intrinsic determination as to the risk of that system and whether or not it's likely that the adverse, uh, that, uh, that that developer would be willing to fix those those vulnerabilities or if for for their uh, commercial capability, they're not worried about it. Uh, we then just wouldn't pursue that. So I don't know if that answers, I, I, I think that answers the question. Okay, so how does uh, CSE support the zero trust and DevOps? And it really is, it's that cyber survivability attribute 10 and defining those security and resilience requirements up front so that, you know, that the operator so that the um, resource sponsor requirement sponsor and operator understand the threats and risks enough and do a criticality analysis so that they can define those cyber survivability cybersecurity and cyber resilience uh, requirements well, articulate them well enough that they can be engineered in so that the system security engineer can actually uh, decompose those consistently and effectively uh, but the, you know, what is that minimum viable capability? We're not going to be, you know, gold plating the systems that are going out that we don't have the money to do it. So, you know, how can we define those zero trust threshold performance requirements that puts you know, zero trust into that DevOps risk trade space so that, you know, with other functionality, you know, there's a lot more money in the system for its regular functionality than it is in the cybersecurity bucket you know what if it's 10 million dollars to get your ato today and a couple hundred million dollars to get the functionality having it in that same operational risk trade space cost schedule performance with all of the other functional requirements ensures at least a consideration that you can buy a hundred million dollars worth of upgrades to this system uh, but if you do and you don't implement the following cyber security and cyber resilience aspects, it won't matter because the system's not going to be available. So that the the you know, the program manager, the resource and requirement sponsors need to be able to have that in the same operational risk trade space. And that's why I focus on DevOps and not DevSecOps, even though I understand the intent of DevSecOps, but that yeah, it, it really, my perspective is it's a holdover from when we did RMF separate from everything else now we actually have performance requirements. Uh, the services have been doing services and uh, agencies and even OSD uh, r and &E have done a great job of taking and implementing uh, cyber survivability framework within their guidance. And this slide here just shows where we are with that. And uh, I did recently brief the CCEB, the Combined uh, Communication Electronics Board for the 5 I partners. And they are they're looking to adopt uh, the CSE so that they can define their threshold performance requirements for a mission partner environment so that they can influence national development. Uh, so, uh, but the services are seeing resource and mission risk benefits and considering cyber survivability. And really any acquisition, any development could benefit from considering cyber resilience in there. And even if, even if they didn't do a good job with the cyber resilience piece, just defining what are their threshold performance requirements for cybersecurity and cyber resilience, balancing those two in any kind of development effort, instead of just saying, here are the standards, here's what training you need to go to to, to be good at, at developing secure code, you know, what is it that, what is the uh, end result? How do you define success in implementing those capabilities? How would you define that cybersecurity and cyber resilience requirement? And the CSE helps that non cybersecurity professional put it into words that a system security engineer can understand. 
Uh, if you want more information on, on cyber survival endorsement, here are some of the uh, places you can go. Uh, it, it, the CSE implementation guide is publicly releasable. Anybody can get it. Uh, it does include very good exemplar text for your risk categories and your cyber story attributes uh, and how those cyber story attributes can be, you know, can support uh, AOA requests for information and even exemplar text for program protection plans, cybersecurity strategies, and requests for proposals. But it really is that bridge between that non-cyber professional and those system security engineers who have to decompose those, uh, those requirements into system specs. Here's what we're doing in the future. We're, we are updating the cyber story attributes all the time. We're trying to show and get, in, get support from people who are attempting to implement zero trust, AI, ML, uh, and even mission partner um, you know, risks. Uh, but um, you, know, you can read all of that. There's, if I don't think I have any of the other slides, nope. So, um, but just realizing the benefits of extending the cybersecurity endorsement framework to all acquisition pathways is, is our primary focus. Uh, the, the Army has done it. Uh, the other services are, are looking into, are, are on a path, I believe, to doing that as well. Uh, but they have definitely come up with those system security engineering guides that most of the people on this call would be looking to would provide that greater uh, granularity. In fact, the, the uh, Air Force's uh, guide is, I think, 300 pages right now. So if you're looking for detail, and have a, you know, that, that'll provide it for you. Here are phone numbers and contact information for, uh, for the team. And uh, I'll get to any questions now that have been languishing out there. Thank you for the presentation, Steve. We do have uh, a question that came into the chat from Eric. He says, how is survivability proven? Will pen testing be bundled into requirements to ensure a system is secure? Uh, okay. We have come up, we have proposed metrics and stuff for, for consideration that would help to, you know, you taking the, um, the deficiency reports from testing and mapping them to the 10 cyber survivability attributes to get you know an, an understanding of the of the risk associated with that um, you know that's taking the, the test community's results and not just the uh, implications from you know the intrinsic risk from from knowing what components are in there uh, <clears throat> we've also come up with some recommend and that and and we have some slides on that as well. I did not include those. I didn't think we would have time. Uh, but if you can define, you know, map those in, and a subject matter expert say that, you know, if if you're, I'm just going to bring it up for me. But if if for cybersecurity attribute one, if you've got incomplete user admin, two-factor authentication, you know, don't have RBAC or PKI and you've, you've got identified physical security access risks, you're definitely red, okay? A subject matter expert would, would say that for controlling access, you'd be red. But now, let's say that you are red today. What can you do over time to potentially get to green? So you, you fully implement user two-factor authentication, RBAC and PKI, and you minimize your remote physical access risk. That might get you to orange. You know, some people might think, well, that gets you even further, but that's that's kind of the best case for that until you can actually validate that. Well, until you can do it for two, for admins as well, and uh, you know, min, you know, and further minimize your physical access risk, and have imp and, and have implement something like compliance to connect policies to ensure that only appropriate you know, only approved people have access and and uh, not just people but resources and processes as well, uh, but you need to, you know, I can show you in a separate slide how that would be done uh, for all of those. But there are other considerations as well beyond uh, the cyber survivability attributes. And today, you know, having an, an ATO doesn't make you green. Okay, that's just a check mark. You you got you 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 don't get credit for that. I mean, you get credit for for having done it but that is not the residual risk being accepted. And the residual risk is what you should be uh, graded on on an authority to operate. Uh, you know, the cybersecurity strategy, it, have they implemented one where they have a cybersecurity attribute 10, where they are actively managing the system over time to achieve and sustain an act, a, a, a reasoned um, and operationally relevant risk posture? 
you know, do they have critical intelligence parameters and uh, has the has the Intel community been updating them on changes in, in, in technology readiness level of capabilities developed and being developed by the adversary that could negatively impact on the capability? When was the last assessment date? You know, if it's over three years, it's probably not very, very effective. Even two to three years is probably not that meaningful. Um, but probably more importantly, what's the level of assessment that was done? You know, if it's two to three levels below the the expected adversary threat tier level, is probably meaningless. Um, you know, what was the score risk scorecard from that last assessment? Uh, and you know, what kind of remediation scorecard do they have in place? Do they have any funded remediations that put them on a path towards green? Uh, and then. The, the big one at the bottom is, uh, do you have a bill of materials for each supported release by hardware, software, firmware, by version number? And in most cases, the answer is no, but that's starting to change. So uh, so those are some of the things there. Other questions? Yes, uh, you have some teammates doing a great job helping you out um, as far as answering some of these uh, questions in the chat, but uh, we did have a couple come in. Um, Jerome says, what DOD program is the farthest in CSC or has an endorsement? I, I, okay, all of them get a system survivability KPP endorsement that go through JSIDs. Um, the cyber survivability, we, we don't do cybersecurity, cyber resilience for the sake of cybersecurity or cyber resilience. We do it for system survivability. And so it is part of that KPP. Um, but that is, like I said, only for the ones going through JSIDs, except for the Army. And the Army is probably going to be able to show you more as to where they are in that process. But uh, just, just because someone has, has considered cyber survivability doesn't mean that the implementation is going to be effective. And that's where Sarah Standard, who's answering a lot of these questions, is coming in. And, you know, they do the developmental testing. And if they have uh, threshold performance requirements for, um, you know, cybersecurity and cyber resilience, it makes their their development of their test plan much easier because now they can actually test to that instead of just testing to see if, if they've, um, you know, if it's easier to get through, you know, if the capabilities they've implemented are effective. So um, I'm, I'm not too sure that that helped with that answer, but um, maybe they can ask the question again if it didn't. Thank you. Here's another one that you kind of hit on um, already as well, but I'll ask it here in this forum. A question from Joe, is there a certification or endorsement for cyber survivability, or is it just a matter of meeting allocated requirements? Okay, we try to help the resource and requirements sponsor to best articulate what their performance requirements are. They are the ones that are, are best at that. We, we can look at it and say that that obviously is not doing due diligence, uh, or we can say, you know, you've, you've been very thoughtful in what you're coming up with here and but it is not, this is not a compliance drill where you've got to get 80 or 90% or, or anything to that degree. This is helping the, the operator, the requirement sponsor, the resource sponsor, be able to articulate requirements that can be defined as threshold performance requirements in an acquisition. And, uh, and that, that seems to be going very well. It is much better than, than just saying, hey, apply, uh, make sure you can, whatever you do, you can get an ATO at the end. So there, I, I'm not sure I can give you a direct answer on that. I don't know if Tom or, or Sarah has been, been coming up with anything else on that, but, you know, but if you send us, if here are our, here are our email addresses, if we didn't answer your question well, or if you want to get copies of our implementation guide, uh, we can provide those to you. Thank you, Steve. Uh, that was great. Um, we're right at an hour now. Um, I believe we've addressed all questions in the chat. Uh, I would like to thank you for your time. Um, I also like to thank the attendees as well as the IAC team. Uh, for those of you who have been uh, attending the CSI webinars for some time, you know that today was our first 
uh, webinar presentation on the WebEx platform. Previously, we're using any meeting. Um, I think the transition was seamless. Um, please give us your feedback in the attached survey. Let us know about the content of the presentation as well as WebEx. Let us know what you would like to see uh, moving forward. This is actually the first webinar of a three part webinar series. Uh, Steve was first up to that. Um, next month in May, we have Katie uh, who's going to present on the system security engineering guidebook, uh, followed by Sarah Standard and Cyber T&E uh, in June. So we hope to see you, see you again. Please check back to the CSI website uh, within a couple of days. Uh, we will be posting the recording to this as well as on our CSI YouTube page. Uh, with that said, logging off, hope to see you next month. Thank you. Yeah, and, and I just want to thank Sarah Standard and Tom and James and everybody else that helped answer the questions online while I was continuing to brief. So thanks for thanks a lot. And the next set of briefings are going to just build upon this. So you'll the stuff I was talking about, they're going to show you how it's actually being how they're actually implementing it. Sounds great. Thank you, everyone.